Welcome back to Out of Your League, everybody. We are in the bowels of the Halliwell Jones Stadium. The bowels, John. The it sounds like a ship, doesn't it? Like a great in. ship. Are you, are you welcome around here? Um, if there were fans here, would you be no, you you tied down like Gulliver's Travels? No, he wouldn't. Um, Matt, well, firstly, probably not because they've heard of who I am. Mm. Whereas Mark would just sail through here, fine. Are you, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are you going to? Are you going to who are you? Are you going to Tesco's? What are you doing here? <laughs> uh, great car park, to no. be fair, isn't it? Really? I don't, probably mm. not. I used to live in Warrington for a number of years, actually. You did. You just don't want to talk road. about those days. They're quite dark days for you. Those. No, they're they? not the great days. Very. Yeah. I love. Th- I think it's a great. Place. Did you, Mark? Did you ever cause any problems here at the Halliwell Jones? Uh, on the field, definitely not. <laughs> um, at John's house, I used to just pop round for a cup of tea every now and again. <laughs> cause more dramas around that place, I think. But, yeah. uh, bit of context to this podcast: we waited an hour and seven minutes to start because the uh, the man on the lawnmower would refuse to stop. John. The man on the lawnmower, <laughs> the greenskeeper, His name's Willie, the groundsman. Willie, you called him. Yeah, Willie. the groundsman at Warrington owes us all an hour. He was, I mean, you've got to respect people who are that stubborn. Mm. He knew we were waiting and he just <laughs> went, you know what? I'm not getting home late for tea. Yeah. I, I will keep mowing this grass. <laughs> Credit to him, whoever he is, get that man a raise. Yeah. That fake laugh you heard in the background, if you're listening and not watching, and if you are watching, you've seen him already. Uh, we are delighted to be joined delighted. by uh, Warrington PDRL star, host of The Last Leg, and of course, host of the new Channel 4 Super League coverage, John. Fantastic. We'll talk about rivals. We'll keep these two apart. Rivals. Sky Sports over here. Of course. Sky yeah. Sports, Adam. Adam Hills is with us. How are you doing, Adam? Um, well, do you know what? I've tried to walk onto this pitch before to film <laughs> stuff, and I, I knew it was never going to be easy. I, I know exactly how much care goes into this pitch, and I know how grumpy that guy is. I was about <laughs> to threaten him with the fact that you were leaving the PDRL team. So just to get him off his, his little tractor. They're a very unusual, a little tractor. Little tractor. <laughs> unusual breed of the, the groundsman. Yeah. I think we, we should do, I think there's a sitcom there, Groundsman mm. of Super League, yeah. which is very cynical. <laughs> they don't say gnarly, much, they're not great for a podcast. You know, just emotionally inept sort of, you know, mm. people and John, angry at life. You've got a un, unique insight because you grew up on a farm, didn't you? I a did, yeah. Farm. It was a pig farm, wasn't it? And he was, he was yeah. talking yeah. us through yeah. all the different techniques, mowing the grass. Yeah, yeah. It probably doesn't translate too well to a podcast <laughs> environment, talking <laughs> through the farming techniques explicitly used by this groundskeeper. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm a farmer. Yeah. They're very territorial groundsmen, aren't they? Very territorial. Well, the pitch is their baby, isn't it? Mm. Is it? No, it is. It is. Yeah. Do not step on this pitch. This um, anyway, enough of that nonsense. Adam, all the things we described <laughs> you as, uh, I mean, what, what are you rubbish at? Because you're also an author. You're writing a book. You've written a book called Rockstar, Rockstar Detectives. Detectives, which is not an autobiography. It's, no. It's that a good, be, although that great, would be a good, good great, autobiography. Great autobiography. <laughs> One. Better than my story, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Of Rockstar Detectives. But it, so this is, a, this is your debut novel, which has been out for a month or so, hasn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. So how did this come about? What is it? It's kind of like it's what I think my daughter hopes her autobiography will be one day. So my <laughs> eldest is now 11, but when she was eight, she, was, she came up to me quite concerned in the kitchen one morning and just went, Daddy... I can't work out if I want to be a rock star or a detective when I get older. <laughs> yeah. Like as if you have to choose one or the other. <laughs> Which path should I go down? <laughs> I know. And I kind of was trying to be encouraging and I went, oh, you can do both. You can be a rock star at night and a detective by day. You can, oh, I'm brilliant. sure you can. And then we started talking about it and I went, this is a really good idea for a story. So she and I kind of came up with this idea of like two 12-year-olds who've become rock stars, instant rock stars through like YouTube and TikTok doing their first ever tour but then whenever, wherever they perform, like a valuable piece of art is stolen, like a Da Vinci or a Van Gogh or something, but all the evidence makes it look like they're the ones doing it. So they've got to like clear their names and work out who's actually stealing the art. And so she and I kind of plotted this out together. This is like Thomas Crown Affair for, for I like it. There's some sort of... You seen Thomas Crown Affair? No, I haven't, Piers clearly. Bro- Piers Brosnan, wasn't it? The yes, yeah. yeah. Right. Carry on, carry on. Like, yeah, so, so well, yeah, my daughter and I then, you know, she then went, okay, you go off and write it. And then, but then I would come back to her and go, right, how do you like this for the cover? And she was like, oh, no, I don't like the font. No, I changed the font and I reckon that should be <laughs> a different colour. So she was like really all over it. Amazing. Um, and yeah, and it's just nice to do something completely different. Like it's still yeah. comedy, but it's just nice to do a, a different type of comedy, I suppose. Yeah, there's, there's loads, of, a few people have gone. Dermot O'Leary's gone into children's books. There's a few David Williams just, did it as well, didn't he? Yeah. This was a lockdown project, right? Well, I was, I'd been approached even before lockdown by, all right, do you know what? I'm going to give you a podcast Come exclusive. Yes. Okay. I'm not going to tell you which publisher this was because it's not the publisher I Penguin. ended up with. No. No. I'm, I ended up with Penguin and they're brilliant. Okay. 
<laughs> no, they're, genuinely, they've been amazing. And this is why I liked Penguin as opposed to another publisher that I went and saw. They kind of called me in for a meeting and said, look, you know, comedians writing books is quite a big thing. You know, as you said, David Williams. And, and they said, you know, do you have an idea for a book? Yeah. And I went, yeah, I think I might. And they went, okay, because if you don't, we can put you in a room with some writers who can come up with some ideas <laughs> and help you craft the book. And I was like... Are you saying I don't write the book? Someone else would write it? It is the face of the book. And, and like, they were like, no, no I don't know. We know. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> wink, wink. So um, I ended up not going with them. Uh, and then I did go with Penguin, who at mm. no point suggested they would get in someone else to write it for me. They actually yeah, wanted the book that I, I wrote. I just think if it, if it had gone into that meeting or accepted the other offer, the book could have had a very different title, couldn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my been god! Serial killers and surgeons, <laughs> or something. <laughs> of, you know what I mean? It could have just been a different Peak book altogether. And rugby league players, eh, but there you go. I love the idea of writing been... a book. Just sort of, I, I just, I, I think I'd sort of go off to the Lake District, just wear a French beret, nothing else, no other clothes, just to sort of look out well, uh, just upon a, a lake, <laughs> penning my latest, penning my latest novel. It's something very romantic about writing a book, isn't it? There, there is. is, but the reality is totally is it different. Like the reality is me in the car, sitting outside my daughter's drum class <laughs> with my laptop, like desperately trying to write in the 30 minutes that she has her class because that's the only time I've got that day. Amazing. That's pretty much. And, but then having said that, in the acknowledgements, I thanked the Australian government for their hotel quarantine system because I did two lots of hotel quarantine, two weeks in a hotel room. They're brutal. They're, they're they system, are brutal. Yeah. So all I did was write. It was like an enforced writer's retreat. Yeah. And so actually what I did was I wrote and I also ran laps of the hotel room, which is... How big was the hotel room? About, I would say, from the door to the window, about the size of this room here, oh. which is like, what's that, maybe 10 metres? So a good size wow. then. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've, you've also got uh, a 400 mile, 400 mile round trip every Tuesday, which we'll get onto, and the PDRL stuff are coming up, of course, to play for Warrington. But I want to go right back because we've got an hour or so. Um, so I want to go back to young Adam yeah. in Australia. And I know a lot of people who've watched The Last Leg know a lot about you, maybe newer to the channel for live coverage of Super League audience. So um, what, firstly, where did the love of comedy come from for you? Love of comedy came from uh, actually where, where my love of rugby league came from. So my dad. So my dad was a Qantas cabin crew. Mm -hmm. um, so he was away for two weeks and he'd be home for a week. And But because he was... Qantas cabin crew, it meant we got um, free flights every now and again. And he loved comedy. He'd come back from overseas with comedy albums. So it would be like uh, Peter Sellers or an American guy called Alan Sherman and we'd watch um, Benny Hill and Dick Emery and all the English comedies together. Um, but when I was about nine, we went on a flight to Los Angeles. And because it was – we got free trips but they were standby. So it was only if there were spare seats. So we would – as a family, our family holidays were we'd turn up to the airport. Just in case. Just in case. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I'm, I'm in the same boat. Going to Milton Keynes. I, you're, 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 I've been there. My stepdad was a captain for BA 35 years. Standby. It's horrible. Yeah. It's, it's great when you get on. Yeah. So, but yeah. Sure. Shock, shock Will's family member was a captain. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> what did, what did he do for you know? over him. He was cabin crew. Okay, so he was a, a flight steward. So go on, you're travelling around. So we would turn up to the airport and this, you know, and we'd always go outside of school holidays because there might be some spare seats then. So this particular one, I think nine, we were going to LA, we got to Sydney Airport, we waited, we waited, we waited, and they said, right, we've got two lots of two seats, yeah. but they're three or four rows apart. So my brother and I sat up front, like whatever row it was, and then my parents were a couple of rows back. And so I started listening to the comedy channel. I didn't know other people listened to comedy. Yeah. I didn't know you could... Like uh, uh, anyone outside of our family would listen to comedy. And so I put it on and started listening. And I got up on the seat and looked back at my parents and went, Mom, Dad, there's a man being funny on the radio. And they're like, just sit and listen to the comedy, Adam. You don't need to shout it. But so I listened to it over and over because it would go for 40 minutes and then it would rewind and then it would play again and then it would rewind. And I'd listen to the same routines. And it was probably people like Billy Connolly, maybe Bill Cosby. And I would just listen to the stories and the way people laughed. And I was just... So I think that that's always, you know, when you see something that you just click with, you absolutely mm. connect with. And for me, it was comedy and in particular stand-up comedy. So that was it. Since mm. I, I always wanted to be a comedian, but I never thought I could. When were you first funny? Ooh. Um, so I remember, I mean, I consciously trying to be funny. I remember in sixth grade writing a, like a comedy sketch to do in front of the school. Um, 
I think that might have been where it started. I remember in fourth grade making a joke about something. Very interesting. I remember in fourth grade making a joke about one of the other kids wearing glasses and everyone laughed except him. And I remember the look on his face and I was like, ooh, I don't like that. I, so it, there's always been this thing in the back of my head of like try and be funny without making someone feel awful. Yeah. Yeah. It was really like I remember that specifically. So... That's interesting I, I, because obviously, you know, we all love different comedians and so on. I mean, yeah. Frankie Boyle went through a period, didn't he, where he was massive and absolutely massive. And he was massive because he, it was so outrageous. His yeah. comedy, he is so outrageous, his comedy and his podcasts. But yours is, you, you want the audience to leave feeling uplifted, right? Yes. But the, the funny thing about is Frankie is he would probably do the same. Like mm. I, there used to be a comedy club in Newcastle that whenever you played there, instead of putting you up in a hotel, they'd put you up in an apartment because the club owned an apartment. So whoever else was on the bill with you, you'd spend a weekend with just, you know, you'd wake up in the morning, have a cup of tea, have breakfast. So I did two weekends there with Frankie. Yeah. And so Frankie and I would just have a cup of tea first thing in the morning and talk. And he was like the deepest guy. We'd be talking about Tai Chi and the universe and the universal energy and like, in, in, in his, you know, he's the roughest guy on stage. So, so the point so where... So comedians are bipolar, basically, aren't they? In that sense. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Well, well, your friends with Jimmy Carr, it's quite similar as well. And those sorts, you know, someone when you have a conversation with him away from his set and his gig and away from that microphone, they're completely, completely different people, no? You, yeah, it always amazes me, even as a, as a comedian, when you talk to other comedians, how much they obsess about their act, how much work that goes into it. Someone like, say, Lee Mack, mm. who you think is... And Lee is naturally funny. He's one of those guys that we all look at and go, I mean, I wish I was like that constantly. But he works so hard and he thinks... Like, I did a, a tour with him in Australia... And we were playing a place called, I think it was Rockhampton. And the biggest story to come out of Rockhampton that week was a girl who'd been missing for like two years was found in her boyfriend's closet. Basically, she'd been living with a boyfriend, run away from home, live with a boyfriend. And whenever anyone came around, she snuck into the closet. And, and finally, she'd been caught. And none of us knew what to say about it. And Lee Mack just walked out and went, so big news here this week. I hear they're making a movie. The lion bitch in the wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> every comedian at the side of the stage went, I mean, that is really good. <laughs> but you know he's worked on that. He hasn't just – he's yeah. gone away, looked at yeah. the – he's read the paper, he's worked out what he could say that night. Uh, um, the, the science of comedy, I mean, you guys, I don't know what kind of comedians you're into. Yeah. not really very funny either of you. But, um, no, no. It, it, uh, we were talking before, Adam, uh, like Jimmy Carr specifically, and I listened yeah. to him on a podcast recently, and he, you know, he talked about the routine of his comedy and whittling down kind of experimented sets to a compact collection, basically, of sort of proven crowd pleasers. Um, and, and, you know, you, you're, I know just from reading up on you, you, you love the ad-libbed moments of comedy because they can't be planned and they're so intimate with an audience and really they're kind of, you can't repeat those moments, can you? Yeah, and it's kind of like, it it, it, it makes the show fun for me. Like I, I love it if someone comes up to me and says, oh, I saw you in Edinburgh in whatever year. If, if they can tell me what I did that night and I remember it, it's like, well, I didn't do that in any other show. So I love it when people can remember those little bits, but also it's fun for me. I don't like going out there and just doing the same jokes over and over. I love to yeah. have a moment with an audience, but it's like, the more I do this and then the more time I spend around rugby league, the more I realise that the sportsman's mindset has so many similarities with the comedian's mindset to the point where um, I, did, I did a gig in Ireland once. It was like a chat, an onstage chat show and the guest was John Kavanagh, who's um, Conor McGregor's coach, Coach Kavanagh. Oh, yeah, I know him, yeah. Right, and so he's sitting backstage and he's watching the comedians walk around and he looked at me and he went, you guys look like fighters. And I was like, well, no one's ever said that to me before. <laughs> and he went, no, but this is like being backstage at a, at a UFC match like the you guys pacing around back and forward and i went do the fighters get this nervous and he was like oh i've had to i've had to pull people in through the toilet window because they're trying to escape the actual venue and i've had that said a few times and i realized that like it's this and the more that and now the more that i play rugby league the more you go well yeah you've got your set plays you you know you go out there with a game plan but you need a little bit of ad living yeah you need yeah. to be able to play what's in front of you yeah and so and i've also realized that i obsess about comedy the way you know, league players obsess about league. Yeah. It's a performance, isn't it, at the end of the day, whether it's rugby or, co or comedy or, or whatever, it's it's that preparation f to perform, isn't it? Yeah. So that you need that detailed, it doesn't matter what you do in life, does it? That detailed preparation, analysis, like feedback, all the things that I think people, they, you know, hold sport in a high regard because that's what sports do really well. It's actually what all competent people do in life, isn't it? Mm. 
you, you're meticulous about your preparation. You plan to produce a performance. You're nervous and anxious about that performance. You deliver it, you review it, and it works like that all the time. Mm -hmm. So I was interested to hear that it's so similar when it when it comes to that comedic performance. Is there's there's that similar cycle. And and there are moments in comedy where whether you're on stage or say you're on a panel show, like I've 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 done panel shows where like my first three jokes have bombed mm. and you go, oh man, I'm, I'm on air for another half hour. <laughs> and this is not even canned laughter. No, no. Uh, yeah. Not even the canned laughter didn't even laugh. <laughs> the canned laughter man didn't even <laughs> turn it up. Doesn't deserve that. <laughs> and so much like when you're playing a sport, the temptation is, well, let's do something big and risky. Let's, let's, let's pull off a massive play that makes yeah. everyone forget the three mistakes that I've just made. But then it just gets worse. So basically, you've got to go back to basics. You've got to sit back. And Has go. that ever gone really wrong for you? Have you been Have you been that uncomfortable in any situation where you've thought, "I've got this wrong. I've chosen the wrong looking for profession. the fire exit." Yeah, yeah, all the time. Um, I remember specifically one episode of Nevermind the Buzzcocks. Where <laughs> so the first joke I did died. Mm. D that happens, and like, all right. And then the next one died. I'm like, oh man. And then the third one died. And then Mark, Mark Lamar was hosting at the time. <laughs> he, went, he went, all right, hold on for a second, Adam. And I went, oh. he went, all right, I'm not going to use his exact words. But he looked at the audience and he went, now, Adam's been on this show before and he was really good. And I asked him back because I quite liked him last time. And that was a really good joke. And you, an idiot, didn't get it. <laughs> so, Adam, do the joke again. And this time laugh, you miserable <laughs> bastard. <laughs> no. <laughs> And, and so your testicles were just <laughs> <laughs> up here. No. It's like your mum like sticking up for you in a fight, yeah. isn't it? I mean, he was trying to do the right yeah. thing. And I kind of laughed and he went, go on, do the joke again. Oh. <laughs> so, of course, I did it again. And, of course, they didn't laugh because they just heard it. <laughs> and he went, oh, you stupid bastards. <laughs> <laughs> so then I felt awful and they hated me. Like nothing I said for the rest of the show went, literally nothing went to air because yeah. nothing was funny. Yeah. So... But what I learned was I just, I thought, well, I'm having a shocker. So I'm just going to, I just have to sit back and just laugh at everybody else's jokes. That's all I can do. Yeah. And then it went to where and I watched it back and I was like, I literally didn't say a word for yeah. the entire episode. And then a friend of mine called me the next day and went, oh, you had a great show last night. I, <laughs> I didn't say anything. She went, yeah, but you were on screen all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds like me on this I was podcast. about to say, yeah, because <laughs> Adam keeps looking at you like he's sort of looking at you like you're going to say something. He, yeah. Basically, he's sort of just devilishly handsome. We have him here for sort of, you know, aesthetic reasons. Just to sit in the background, yeah. But he pops up with a few like, one-liners <laughs> now. There. Well, it's hard to get a word in you two. By the way, you, can, you can't say fuck shit, piss, wank and bugger, whatever you want on this. Oh, can you? So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's good to know. People are obsessed with watching comedians fail though, right? Oh, yeah. Aren't they? Yeah. Because like, people get off on it. It's someone, someone put it to me very early on that you, you enjoy watching a comedian on stage doing well yep. because you like to think that's what you'd be like if you were up there. Mm. But when they're dying, you realise that's actually what you'd be like if you're up there. Yeah. There's it's, something kind of sadistically quite entertaining about them dying as well. Oh, you, know, when, you know when you just sort of go and you I, pay five well, pounds in the comedy oh, store in Manchester or something? Yeah, yeah. I, no, I can't do that. I laugh just to make them feel bad. <laughs> but I, I, had a, I feel really bad. I had a, went to a comedy event and um, there's a guy who sang Neil Diamond songs and had a yo-yo. So, <laughs> but was so that his already, already. <laughs> You know, but as he was playing the yo, -yo like you know, yo yo in between the Neil Diamond songs, he was telling jokes, but nobody. It was it was like cutting edge stuff, yeah. and you're in Saint Helens, and this guy's like, you know, telling these obscure jokes whilst, you know, it just, it, you know, it got to a stage, and some guy just shouted, "Fuck off!" <laughs> and, 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 and it, but it, I, do you know, I at that point I felt. Like a joke. Awful. Mm. Yeah. Like I couldn't, I didn't enjoy it. But there's somebody turned up there and heckled him who's enjoyed that process. Yeah. Haven't they? There's hecklers yeah. out there. Have you not been I, on Twitter recently well, in the no, last 15 yeah. years? Look, it happens. But that raw live yeah. moment where everyone's quiet and somebody shouts, fuck and off. You've got to keep the energy. I mean, you've got to keep that smile that you've got now. Like, you can't let it drop. I, I'm, I'm interested also because, you know, even away from the stage, comedians. I mean, human beings, we all wear a mask, don't we? We yeah, all, yeah, to yeah. some degree. Yeah. Yeah. But comedians can't let it slip, at least publicly. So is that for you therapeutic? Is it exhausting to have that constant expectation to be funny? Yeah. What, I, <coughs> what I've learned is that um, I, I, I'm not constantly funny. Mm. Like I think about it and I work really hard at it, but it, I don't feel like 
if you saw me out in public, I'd be a laugh a minute. You go home and you electrocute guinea pigs in the basement. Because <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> like yeah. that's funny. Uh, <laughs> that is so but what I've realised is, like even today, coming up here today to Warrington, I got in the cab and the cab driver recognised me. Yeah. And we started chatting. And But what I've learned is people... Like, it's really boring if you just do jokes at people for 30 minutes, <laughs> like in a cab. Like, eventually he'll be like, oh, mate, I've had enough. He just wanted a chat. Yeah. And so... <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> He's doing a routine in the back in an Uber. <laughs> do you ever say that people just say, it's always a joke? Though? Good practice, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. good, good rehearsal yeah. stage, isn't it? <laughs> to the Uber man. If you, make an Uber, if you make 10 Uber men laugh in a week... Well, I'm you just... say Jimmy Carr. Jimmy's one of those people, and I say this as a positive, who will do jokes constantly. So I flew from Montreal to London with Jimmy once after the Montreal Comedy Festival. Yeah. He was constant in a way that I was really admiring. Yeah. Like I remember the 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 um cabin crew coming up and saying, uh have you look at have you had a look at the menu? Is there anything you'd like to order? He said, and, No daddy I've you already eaten <laughs> <laughs> Well funny, because my dad's cabin crew, I'm always very polite and yeah. respectful and I was like, oh yes, I'll have um, you know, whatever the pasta is, please. And she looked at Jimmy and he went there's nothing here I like. Can I order a pizza? <laughs> and she went, we don't do pizzas. And he went, delivery. <laughs> Fair play to you. I'm, je- I'm jet lagged. I just want to go to sleep. You are still doing jokes. In fact, we were talking. Okay. We we're talking before about. The, the, uh, so Russell Crowe has amazing dinners. He throws lovely One dinners. of Mark's best friends, by the way. I know. Yeah. I met him for about two hours, but yeah. We're close. Yeah. That's how we started chatting about it before. <laughs> so rec- we've realized that you and I almost crossed paths last yeah. year in that. So Sam Burgess had come up for, was it your testimonial? Yeah, my testimonial dinner. Yeah. And he said, I can come up for a couple of hours and then I need to get back down to London for 11 o'clock. I was like, man, you're not getting to London in an hour and a half. He went, oh, Russell sorted some transport for me. Ended up being a helicopter, obviously. <laughs> Send a chopper. He ended up going to the same dinner where you were. Yeah, so I'm at this. Russell Crowe had texted me in the afternoon and said, "What are you doing for dinner tonight?" And I was like, well, "I'm <laughs> right. Good text I look, what a circle to be in." That was a WhatsApp group. Yeah. Uber <laughs> famous. <laughs> Uber famous. That's a good WhatsApp group. Group. You're like fucking crows messaging me again. Yeah. What do you want for dinner tonight? Oh. <laughs> do you know what? Genuinely, it was like four in the afternoon. I was writing the last leg script, and he said, "Dinner tonight, ten o'clock." And I was like, um, "I'm, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I've got to try and finish this script." And he just wrote back. Dumplings make you funnier. See you at 10. <laughs> but then followed up with, someone's coming at 11.15, you'll be happy to see. Yeah. I was like, all right. 11.15, Jimmy Carr walked in. And I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, I know Jimmy, but Russell knows I know Jimmy. But anyway, hey, how are you? And then five minutes later, Sam Burgess walked in, fresh, <laughs> off, fresh off the chopper. That's it. Yeah. And Sam was like, he winked at me and the, uh, sorry, Russell winked at me and then went, Sam, you can sit next to Adam. Uh, I was like, all right. That's so I, like someone's final sort of... Uh, Final wish, isn't it, before they die? Is it, is it a dinner party, yeah. isn't it? I mean, those people around the table. Oh, God, imagine <laughs> if that's one. how you find well, out. If he's, dressed, you if he's dressed as Gladiator as well. <laughs> yeah. You need you to get invited <laughs> to those things, don't you? They sound so good. Who else cool, was like. it? Tom Jones. Tom Jones was Tom there. Tom Jones. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Fry. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. they're, they're a bit more like you, Sam, Russell. There's a, you know, there's a tan, like a tangible link. Maybe the comedy with Jimmy Carr. <laughs> yeah. Then Tom Jones for me, he's the he's the uh, yeah. the outlier. Yeah. He's the outlier in it all. Yeah. yeah. Right. What's Tom Jones doing there? Well, that's what I want to. Oh no, I know Why the answer to Tom this. Jones there? If you want to know, yeah. yeah, I know the answer to this. So apparently, years ago, Russell was touring and he was staying at a hotel. Uh, Might have been, I think it was Rookery Hall, and. Tom's Tom Jones's wife had just passed away and he had gone to just spend some time out in the country and was at the same hotel and Russell found out and went over to Tom and said, if you want to have a chat, if you just want to hang out, you know, I'm a friendly face. And they became friends because of that That's apparently. Cool, yeah. So it's actually really yeah. lovely. Yeah. But it's weird at those dinners because Tom Jones is there and like... You, Tom you know, Jones is you, there. You don't know what to say. Because Tom, Tom Jones is there. It <laughs> is quite an odd... How do you, that's Tom Jones. <laughs> because we were... Okay, so we were at one of those dinners and it was... I've never told this to anyone like, <laughs> publicly. We were at one of those dinners and there was like David Williams and Jimmy and myself and Tom Jones and the conversation got to people you would have loved to have met. And I think Williams went, oh, I would have loved to have met... Um, Elvis, of course, would have loved to have met Elvis. And then Jimmy went, did you ever meet Elvis, Tom? He went, oh, yes, when I was playing a Las Vegas residency, he used to come backstage every night and sing songs to me. And you're like, oh, my God, of course, you just forget. <laughs> and then there Tom was, Trump, you can't beat that. You can't. And then at one point I was sitting next to Tom Jones and I was like, I don't know what to say. Yeah. I don't know what to come and say. And I remembered one tiny fact and I went, can I ask you a question? And he went, yes. And I said, 
when you sang Thunderball for the James Bond movie, I read a story that you passed out on the final note. Is that right? And he went, oh, no, but I nearly did. <laughs> and then he told me this whole story. <laughs> John Barry had an whole orchestra in the studio <laughs> next to me. And he said, Tom, keep singing until the orchestra finishes. It's going to go really long. And I got to the end and I forgot to take a breath. <laughs> and I, these exact words. You said I could swear, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Go and he it. said, I forgot to take a breath, but I knew I didn't want to ruin the take and I just stood there in the in the booth thinking oh Tom you stupid <laughs> <laughs> so I kept singing and put my arms out and my legs started to go and I felt myself about to pass out then if you listen to the song at the very end I went I went flat and the bastard kept it in <laughs> <laughs> that's the fourth C-bomb we've had this series I think, isn't it? Well, it's Paris well Hilton's got nothing on us and it yeah. came from Tom Jones anyway the, the whole point of going back to this story is that Sam Burgess turned up so I had a great old chat to Sam I'd never mm. met him before and it was brilliant and then there was a young girl that had turned up that was a friend of Sam's who, gorgeous, really stunning. Jimmy Carr didn't really know who Sam Burgess was. Yeah. So Jimmy virtually started roasting him, kind of going, he's looking at Sam and this, this young girl going, and then he looked at me and he went, Adam, do you remember that TV show I used to host where you'd have a couple on where one was markedly hotter than the other one and you'd wonder why the two of them were together? Do you see where I'm heading here, Sam? <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. And I'm like, Jimmy, no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's maybe one of the fuck-offs where you don't want to be heckled, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 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 He's not quite understood it's Sam Burgess. He'd have, he'd have taken that quite well, I think. Yeah, Jimmy would have got his yo-yo out. Started singing Neil Diamond. <laughs> Look, but again, I, fair play to him because he was on. He was just yeah, he yeah, was yeah. being the comedian. Um, I, I'm glad in so many ways that it's actually taken me half an hour to even mention your disability, which I, don't, I, I know it's not mm. even a word you like using and I don't like using. So let's call it a situation because it's, cause it's, it's, a, it's a situation that, that has led you to do some great things and help so many other people as well. Um, but obviously for those who don't know, you, you were born without a right foot. Yep. Um, did that give you, a, 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 I guess it gives you a license to, to go where other people can't go in terms of your comedy? in terms of what you can say and what you can get away with. Kind of, but I didn't talk about my foot on stage for like the first 13 years of doing stand-up. And I remember being at the comedy store. So when I first started out, I, I used to MC a lot because I, because I could ad-lib. Mm. And sometimes you do two shows a night. And I remember this one night, the, the, half the crowd from the early show came back to the late show. And I was like, oh man, you've seen all my jokes. Like I've only got 15 minutes and I can't trot out the same stuff to you again. <laughs> So I made a joke about my foot and I said, um, I mentioned that I had a prosthetic foot and said that I'd been at a party the week before and said I had a prosthetic foot and a woman said, can you still have sex? <laughs> <laughs> what? That's all I said about it. Like there was nothing more to it. And I went backstage and there was an older comic on the bill, really lovely guy. And he went, but he took me aside and he went, you're not good enough to talk about your foot yet. I went, what do you mean? He went, you, you just made a joke about a thing that happened, but why? And I went, I don't know, because it was funny. And he went, that's, he said, right. You need to get really good at comedy, yeah. right? And then you need to work out what you want to say about your foot. So it goes full wow, circle just being into a joke. A yeah. It's like so the so secret weapon. Yeah. Hold it back. Work, work your craft first. Yeah. So I didn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. for like, and I don't know what I was consciously waiting for, but I knew yeah. that one day I might. And then 2001, I was nominated for the Perrier Award at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Yeah. And what I took away from that was I've done it. I've proved myself. I can talk about it now mm. because – and my thinking was if I get nominated again, then I know I've done it once without talking about my foot. Yeah. I know it's not a sympathy yeah. vote. And then two things happened. Then 9-11 happened and three days after 9-11, I had to fly to Paris for a show and everyone was really scared in the airport and my foot set off the metal detector. And the guy was like, he was like Heathrow and he's like, right, what's going on? And, start, and as soon as he found out, I said, oh, it's a prosthetic. And he went, oh, I'm sorry, mate, go through, go through. And I'm like, well, no, check, there might be a knife. Yeah, and yeah. he's like, no, 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 it's all right, mate, it's all right. <laughs> and I thought, right, now I know why I want to talk about it, which is I want people to know that it's okay. Yeah. So yeah. I got back from Paris, went on stage in Dublin, uh, which is where I was living at the time, and then talked about it and told that story about the guy and then added... Um, yeah, that he had a look on his face that said, I don't care if the plane goes down, I don't want to offend a spastic. <laughs> Which is like, oh, and again, then I could go where nobody else could go. Then I could yeah. make those jokes. But then... I came up with the punchline for the original joke, which mm. was the woman who said, could you still have sex? Mm. I told that story again 13 years later yeah. and said, I was once at a party and a woman said, 
you know, when I found out I had a prosthetic foot, said, can you still have sex? And I was like, well, yeah, what does your boyfriend do? <laughs> does he take a run up? <laughs> and so suddenly I've taken something that happened to me. I've added a punchline yeah. because I'm yeah. 13 years better at comedy and I've got found a reason to talk about it. So, yeah, it took me ages to get to that point. It's interesting that you, you sort of held that back, really, and sort of proving that you were capable before unleashing yeah. maybe something that was always going to be valuable to it. Did you have material... In the in your mind, obviously, that you you know you knew right. This is big. I want to unleash this at some stage, or or did it just come? No, no. That was the weird thing. I had never. And I, then once I started talking about it, I'd have friends going, "Oh, you should tell that story about that thing you did, or you should do." And you go, "Oh yeah, right. I never thought realized that was funny." So it was stuff that I just thought was normal yeah, yeah. that other people then suggested that I should talk about. But there is a thing I think with disability. Like so, I played. You know, I played rugby league at high school and I played touch until I got to high school and then I played league. I played tennis. I, if you, I think even when I was 12, I was asked if I wanted to like try out for the Paralympics, but it wasn't called the Paralympics. I was told it was the disabled games. Mm. And in my head, I was like, no, no, if I play tennis, I'm going to go to Wimbledon against able-bodied people. And I played tennis against able-bodied people and I played league against able-bodied people because I was like, I want to do what everybody else can do. Yeah. I don't want to be the different kid. Yeah. And I think that's what I took into comedy. You're taking that same mentality. Exactly. And what I find interesting though is that you had the mindset that um, you, you wanted to be a comedian for yourself more than the plaudits or the fame or the money. You, 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 you steered away from the easy gag because it was more intrinsically valuable to yourself to... To, to be good in your own eyes. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing, is that my manager once said that the comedians that he likes are the ones that, in a, in a way, don't like the spotlight, mm. but, but need to get this out of their system. So, yeah, you're exactly... I mean, I was surrounded by good people who told me good things, like, don't talk about your leg straight mm. away. And then I had a manager at the time who said, if you do jokes about your leg now, you'll be the one-legged comedian for the rest of your life. Yeah. Work out mm. how to do comedy first. But, yeah, I... I I have probably turned down, especially TV things that would be like either really well paying or really high profile because I've gone, yeah, but it's not, it's not the type of comedy that I want to do. Mm. So yeah, you know, you're exactly right. I've got, I had a real, from early on a real sense of what kind of mm. comedy I wanted to be doing. And, and look, you find jokes and you find humour and comedy in, in awkward situations and, and topics and subjects which people aren't comfortable hearing about, <laughs> which is why it's so taboo and people love it. Um, I mean, your dad died um, in yeah. 2012. Slight gear change. But you um, ended on a high note, quite literally. <laughs> tell, tell that story. That was, that was a, like a little kind of epiphany because I think there's something in every comedian's head of, I should get a real job. Like, it's not a real job that I do. And I'm aware of that. Like, you know, we joke about that we might work for 15 minutes a day. Oh, it's so stressful. I've got to get up on stage for 20 minutes. <laughs> oh. um, but so my dad had cancer and we kind of joked all the way through it. He, we had a, <laughs> he had a, um, a kick cancer in the dick dance that we used to do. <laughs> Class. So whenever, Class. like, you know, he'd go off to the hospital or whatever for a treatment, I'd go, what are you going to do? And he'd go, I'm going to kick cancer in the dick. And we, <laughs> and we had a little thing as a family. <clears throat> from a Mel Brooks movie called History of the World Part One where there's like a town meeting and someone says, all right, meeting's finishing. Shall we end it on a high note? And then everyone goes, Wee! So good. So good. <laughs> so my family, whenever I saw my, I'd go home, see my mum, see my dad, and then we'd, we'd finish on a high note. And I still do it now with my wife and kids. Um, so there was a moment in where my dad had had, he had leukaemia, he had a stem cell, um, um, bone marrow transplant, <clears throat> And his body was rejecting the donor and all that kind of stuff. And he was in kind of intensive care. And the, basically the doctors kind of came in and said, look, I, we're going to try one more thing, but there's not much more we can do. And to see a look, especially when you're a comedian, a doctor is like the antithesis of what you do. Mm. I bet that's the ground. Is that the groundsman? <laughs> yeah, he's just checking. Not a good time to open the door, the was it? Quite <laughs> just mid, midway look. through. Yeah. One of the um, more serious stories yeah. of the podcast. <laughs> Go on, Alan. So... Yeah, and I just remember the look on the doctors. Like, yeah, as a comedian, you look at doctors and think, that's a proper job. You mm. save lives. I can't do that's that. That's serious. There's yeah. no laughing there. No, exactly. I just make jokes. Like, how ridiculous is that? But I remember the doctor kind of looking at me and looking at my dad with that look on his face of, I mean, I, there's nothing more. I don't know what else to do. And I kind of had this, it's such a weird moment of thinking, I can still make him laugh though. Like, you can't do anything, but I can still give him a laugh. And so we cracked a couple of jokes and then I remember saying to him, right, um, 
look, I don't know how this, we don't know what's going to happen. And he was a really bad way. And I, but I said, shall we end on a high note? And I still went, ee! and he managed to go, ee! and that was pretty much the last thing he said to me. Beautiful. And I kind of, it kind of made me go, do you know what? I can't save lives. I can't, you know, if someone comes yeah. in and they've hurt themselves, but I can, I can still do comedy. I can still make people have a fun night out. And I think as a comedian, you forget that. Like, it yeah. becomes a job. I, I realise that playing rugby towards the end. Obviously, when you play for a club, you've, there's, I think there's an expectation to, to do right by the jersey and to entertain people and to make their lives better. And if, if that's, you know, people might not be on much money and they, 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 they spend their disposable income going to watch you on a weekend, there's a responsibility to do your best and entertain. And I think that's something that comedians have is they bring joy, they bring value to other people's lives. And there's something, you might even say it's 10 minutes work a, a week, but if you're adding value to other people, there's something that's really but, yeah, important. And that. that it's an amazing thing that you're able to add that value at the moment in which your father's passing away. You know, that's not a gift many people have. Do you know that that's a yeah, real yeah. blessing to be able to make something that's so dark and, and actually contribute something that's light and positive in, in that situation. Because that must have been incredibly tough. You're making it through, you know, how you look and talk about it, you're making it feel sort of easy, but that must have been an incredibly tough situation. Absolutely, it was awful. It was awful. But, yeah, and I guess to, th to think that I still managed to make him laugh and we still managed to share that moment, because that's kind of, you know, without getting too deep about it, that's what life is. Like, you don't know how long you're going to be here for. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a great... Um, I think it's Harold Ramis that directed Ghostbusters. Oh, it was in Ghostbusters. Used to used to carry a scrap of paper with him that just said, uh, "Life is ridiculous, so why not be one of the good guys?" Mm. And I, I really love that. It's like, yeah. yeah, if you can make the most out of every moment, and you can, you, honestly, obviously, you can't find joy in every moment. But if you can try, and as you say, to think, you know, what's this hold? Fifteen thousand people for for eighty minutes come out, forget about everything that's going on in life get involved in a game and hopefully come away. If you've given your best, mm -hmm. then you're exactly right. Yeah. That's, that's value adding to other people's lives. We, we, we can get deep in this podcast as well. We can talk about John's pencil dick one minute and then oh. the next minute we could be, we could <laughs> okay. be talking about you being on, you know, next to your father on his deathbed. That's what we do, Adam. That's what we do. Um, and neat, do you know what? That, that made, made me think as well about goodbyes because I, uh, one of the best podcasts, I encourage people strongly to go and watch this, is with Will Smith and Jay Shetty. And mm. if you haven't, it's on YouTube. No. Most amazing episode I've ever seen where Will Smith, um, who quite similar to you, his dad was dying. They kind of knew it was, you know, it wasn't getting run over by a bus. It was, um, it was a cancer. So it was, you yeah. know, he had months mm. and months and months and years to, to say goodbye. And every time they said goodbye and they said hello, they made sure they said goodbye and they said hello because they right. never knew when the last goodbye would be. And you had that last goodbye. And like, we don't do it at all as humans, do we? Say goodbye like this could be the last goodbye to someone to a loved one you know in a really weird way i sometimes think like um <laughs> my brain censored and then uncensored and then censored and then went fuck it i'm just gonna say it um cancer is almost like the polite killer because it does give you time to say goodbye mm. it's like mm. the ira of diseases because it phones ahead and it gives you yeah, yeah. Warning. <laughs> evacuates everyone <laughs> 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 and that's how a comedian's brain works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they all got out in Manchester, didn't they? Quite safely. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Yeah. But it is, it, you know, from people I've known, you know, I got to say goodbye to my dad. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't, he didn't get hit by a bus. He, he didn't die suddenly. And I, I, I never was left wondering, oh, if only I'd told him all the things I wanted to tell him. I got mm -hmm. to tell him, you know, I would have liked him to have been around a bit longer and seen a bit more, but at least I got to say goodbye. Just, just sticking with that emotion then, and obviously if people listen to us thinking we haven't really talked much about rugby league, um, we're moving into that territory. So thinking about your dad and thinking about the, the, the PDRL mm -hmm. side of your life, which is a massive, and, and I, I mean, I described it to you earlier, like the Vicar of Dibley, of what you've done, you're kind of Dawn <laughs> French, bringing everyone together in, in a beautiful way. Um, he, uh, the bunny that he gave you when you were a baby, a South Sydney Rabbitohs bunny. Yeah. I mean, he, he brought rugby league into your life. So my grandfather grew up, to go back, my grandfather was born at the base of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, like in a, in a, in a house, um, and he remembers seeing the last stone going in the top of the Sydney Harbour Bridge because they were allowed to stay up till midnight to watch it go in because wow. it had to be done at midnight because it would then expand during the day. But if they did it during the day, it would all shrink and then there'd be gaps. So... And at the time, that was if you lived there, you supported South Sydney. 
and then my granddad worked at making Holden cars and John Sattler worked on the um, production line yeah, with him. Yeah, loose forward for the sales. Yeah. Rabbitohs legend. Yeah. Uh, and so then my dad was a Rabbitohs supporter mm -hmm. and then we moved to the... Well, I grew up in the Shire, so I should have been a Cronulla supporter. And I think maybe because of that, my dad got in early and when I was three days old, brought a red and green rabbit into the hospital for me. So the bond, the, the Rabbitohs bond with my dad, you know... You know, you hear like kids in America, there might be movies. Like, yeah, all I could talk to my dad about was baseball. We hated each other the rest of the time. Well, my dad and I didn't hate each other the rest of the time, but we always bonded over the Rabbitohs. Yeah. So, um, and like I said, you know, I played, I played touch rugby until I, was, until I got to high school and then I played rugby league. But I think two things happened. One, it became obvious that having a prosthetic and, and most of the guys in our PDRL team, I've realised, who were born with a disability, got to about 12, 13, 14. That was about the age that the kids who didn't have a disability were, were noticeably getting further ahead. Mm. Um, but also, for some reason, our, the rugby league coach left the school and we got a union coach in. I was like, I don't even understand that game. <laughs> I, I can't get my head around union. So, And I'd been playing tennis since I was a kid, so I headed more towards tennis. I ended up becoming a tennis coach. I played A grade. Um, but there was always that rugby league thing in the back of my head and my dad and I would still go to league games together. Um, so I think part of this kind of obsession with rugby league again, it kind of, well, I haven't realised until, until I thought of it, it kind of makes me closer to my dad, even yeah. though he's passed well, away. Well, that's yeah. exactly mm. what I read into when I was looking at it, yeah. Yeah. And it's a, that's an, it's a wonderful story. Um, I mean, because essentially the, the, the Warrington side of the PDRL, I don't know, Leeds and Alex Brooker, and you know, there's a few yeah. teams emerging now, but you, know, you were the brainchild behind it and getting it all together, kind well, of. It came about, so someone tweeted me to say, did you see that the, the South Sydney Rabbitohs won the PDRL mm. premiership? I didn't even know there was a PDRL. So I kind of looked it up and went, oh my God, there are people with disabilities playing for the Rabbitohs. And so the next time I was in Australia, I called their PDRL team and went, look, I'm just interested. Can I help promote? And, and the guy just didn't know who I was. Fair play to him. And he was like, yeah, sure, man. What's your name again? I went, Adam. And what do you do? And I, I, like, I've been, I've been on TV a bit. Maybe I can help promote. He was like, right. And I said, do you think maybe I could play? And he went, oh, you need a disability. And I went, oh, I've got a disability. <laughs> oh, I've got one. <laughs> And then he went, but you live in London, right? And I went, yeah. And he said, well, why don't you contact Warrington? Because he said, literally last week, someone from Warrington just contacted me and said, we want to start up England's first PDRL team. So I got back here, called someone at the foundation. The Wolves had one match left. It was a home game, I yeah. think, that week. And he said, well, why don't you come down to a captain's run here at the Halliwell Jones? We'll get a whole bunch of people, because they had a disability football team here, but not a rugby league team. And said, we'll just, we'll have a, we'll promote it, we'll get the press down, and we'll have a bit of a captain's run against the first grade team. So it was like Stefan Ratchford and, you know, Kevin Brown and um, well, Joe Philbin was there, like the whole team, basically. And I brought my boots and had a bit of a run and just suddenly was addicted again and went, oh my God, <laughs> there's a chance I might be able to do this again. And I love the way your wife described it. Ali, your wife. Who, oh, yeah. Is an opera singer as well, isn't she? She is an opera yeah. singer, yeah. She, and she said, uh, it's definitely a midlife crisis. At least he's not having an affair or buying a Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> he's, dry, he's going to warrant. <laughs> he, may, he may be having an affair. He's getting warrant, a drink. He's <laughs> in, in the Victoria <laughs> Hotel. Or, you know, he's yeah. yeah, she thinks I'm playing rugby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all a guy. <laughs> That's a, br <laughs> a brilliant way of summing it all up. I mean... Again, something else, if you haven't watched it, go and watch it. It's absolutely brilliant. I only watched it today, which I'm ashamed of myself for watching it today. Bearing in mind it came out in, what, 2018, the I documentary? Think, yeah, 2019. Channel 4. Think, yeah. Take His Legs is brilliant. And you can still watch it on, um, whatever it's called? Four Four. Four Four. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the characters in there. I mean, when I came into the Halliwell Jones this afternoon, I was like, where's Keith? I want to, I yes. want to meet Keith. Keith, uh, who's been around the club for a long time. Keith has Down syndrome. I don't even want to say what the disabilities are with, with the guys because that's not what it's about but you know you've got people with cerebral palsy and Josh and Tony who drives up all the way from Devon you thought your journey was long from North London I know you come from Devon yeah um, Dan's story who you know had a, a, an accident involving a lorry lost his leg you bonded with him in terms of the, the leg side of things because you know he's a below knee amputee I think isn't he or is he he's a, above an knee? above knee above knee the amazing thing about Dan so he lost his leg he played rugby you know as a kid um, but then he lost his leg above the knee in a, in a lorry accident. He was cycling and was run over by a lorry. And so when we started PDRL, he came down for the first open trial. And I remember the look in his eyes in, in the, when we get in the changing room. 
And I was looking at him because all the, all the other guys I'd seen down here, I was like, oh, yeah, they're all pretty good. He was buff. And I looked at yeah, him and went, yeah. you're serious, right? And he went, oh, I'm going to smash you. <laughs> and it was meant to be non-contact, but every time he ran at me, it got a little bit harder. It's really a little sinister. Bit harder. Yeah. You've, really you've told us the story on stage before at the grand final when we spoke about it. But, but I mean, we're all laughing now. What happened to Dan? Is oh, yeah. So after the first game, he... He did so much damage to his stump that he had to have it reamputated. I mean, that had to is go up another ten centimeters, and he did it straight away so that he could then get back out on the pitch as soon as possible. But he would come down to training because you know yourself when you're injured, you don't want to be sitting at home while everyone yeah, else is yeah. training. So it's like, no, come down, come down. And he he turned up on crutches, and I was like, where's your leg? <laughs> and his wife was so worried that he was going to start training prematurely and, and do himself damage, she hid his leg. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and I asked her where and she said, somewhere he'll never look, it's in the washing machine. <laughs> 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 so he now, he then came with us to Australia. I think he played one more game and his doctors just went, you can't play anymore. Like you, you, you just can't. Yeah. And so he now plays for the Warrington Wheelchair Rugby League team. Brilliant. Uh, who have just joined the Super League as well. Yeah. So it's been, it's, it's, what's amazing about it is seeing, because seeing people like Tony. So Tony is, is, when he first turned up, he was quite shy mm. and quiet. And, and not just everyone with a disability, you know, you're, you're always different. You, and, yeah. you know, especially if it's a visible disability. I'm lucky. You, but I, if I can wear jeans and people can't see the prosthetic. But if you're missing an arm, you're missing a hand, you've got mm. cerebral palsy you know you look a bit different and you always feel a bit out of place. And it's amazing watching these guys turn up at training kind of quiet and a bit self-conscious and then gradually looking around and going, so everyone here has got a bit missing yeah. or a thing. Mm -hmm. And then once you start playing, if everyone's got a disability, then no one's got a disability. That's what is, you summed it up perfectly because that's exactly what I was thinking. And I, I, to, the imagery for people listening to this, I bizarrely went to climb Kinder Scout on my own this morning in the Peak District and I was watching the documentary on the train and I started crying on the train because it's such, it's such a stunning piece of television. It's beautiful. If you haven't watched it, go and watch it. it because that's what comes across. It's, there's a, it's a space where no one is judged. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's, it's, that it's that build. sense of belonging in a yeah. team as well that's really special. Like I, I've loved playing numerous sports and being part of a team and it's something I've probably missed since retiring. Yeah. But I'd imagine that some, some of the lads haven't had that that safe space in a team environment before because they've never fitted in in, in, in normal surroundings. And I yes. think that's something really powerful that they, that can be kind of taken advantage of. Well, and also, you know, if you've got a disability and you play rugby league against able-bodied people, they will go easy on you. Mm -hmm. You know they're going to go easy yeah. on you. And But when all of us get out there, no one goes easy. Like, no, we, we don't go stupid, but it's nice to play and not think... It's nice to score a try and think... I've actually earned this try. Yeah. 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 And when <laughs> yeah. we played... So what's not on the documentary is we played in Australia and we played a friendly against the Rabbitohs. Mm. I think that bit might be. So Josh, who's got cerebral palsy, yeah. made a break and he, he went about 15 metres. Buzzing. It was absolutely buzzing afterwards. And then the Rabbitohs people put the, the game up on YouTube and he watched it back and he realised one of them let him run. Yeah. Fuming. Yeah, he was so that. dirty. Yeah. Because that's the worst thing you can do. Yeah. It's condescending, even, isn't it? Yeah. And even to the point where... So Sean Briscoe played as one of our able-bodied players for a while. Because every, every team has two able-bodied players mm. who can't run more than 10 metres with the ball and they mm. can't score. So they're there just to facilitate everybody else. Mm. And Brisk came down to training one night and he went, right, lads. And we may have talked about this as well, but he said, you've got people with disabilities coming out. If a guy with a disability is about to tackle you, you've got to work out what his disability is and you've got to use it against him. And we were like, that doesn't sound right. And he's like, it's like any other play. If I'm, if, this, if, if, I'm, if I'm playing Super League and a guy comes to tackle me and I know he's got a weakness on one side, I'm going to go to that side. Why yeah. should it be any different for someone mm. with a disability? Yeah. The guy's coming at you with one arm. He's patronising not yeah. to, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. To attack somebody's weakness. That's exactly. Sport. It's the essence of sport, isn't yes. it? Hang on, I'm going to keep hitting it to Adam's backhand, which is incredible. Or I know he can't hit, it, you know... Yes, it's 100%. No, that's exactly what I was thinking about, actually. I really wanted to ask you that because, you know, obviously you went on to win the World Club Challenge against the Rabbitohs, which is a dream for you because you actually vividly had dreams as a kid of kicking the winning goal in a, in yeah. a World Club Challenge. And you but for the Rabbitohs, not against them. With your foot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what's so beautiful. But when results are on the line, because this isn't, you know, it, it's a whole other podcast to talk about kind of 
is it the, the, the taking part that counts or the winning or whatever? But when you go into PDRL, you know, there's some of the hits you're taking. You got knocked unconscious and were in tears because you thought you'd let your daughters down. You know, this yeah. is some serious shit. So does does that impact the beautiful everyone can have a go? Because the disabilities are so wide ranging, aren't they? And some are far more restrictive for others. And, and like you say, that that's heartbreaking to know that he saw that. And, and where, where does that start and stop? And how is that controlled on a pitch? It's this is unbelievable. Exactly, that is exactly the question that goes to the heart of every disability sport mm. is because you want it to be competitive, but you want it to be inclusive. And you've got to balance that. And so I'm on the board of the PDRL here with um, you know, Barry McDermott's on the board as well and we because he's played a few times. And there's a whole bunch of us that, you know, the, the World Cup's coming up this year. Mm. And so what we realised that when we went out and played against the Rabbitohs, they have a different almost entry limit onto what they consider disability. So they mm -hmm. looked at some of our guys and went, well, that's not disabled enough. But like, well, Tony's lost all his fingers on one hand in an in a industrial accident. But he can run the 100 in 10 seconds. He can run the 100 in 10 seconds. But like we had a moment where Andrew Johns played with us and he kind of went, right, Tony, go out onto Hillsy's wing. We'll put him over in the corner. And Tony went... I can't catch if it comes to me from the right. <laughs> <laughs> you can only play yeah. I have to be on the right side of the pitch. And Joey was like, oh, man. Right, Hilsey, you go out to Tony's side. We'll put him you're, in the you're describing a very similar sound to a lot of dressing rooms I've been in there, really? <laughs> unfortunately. Mm. So, so this is the thing. We're trying to find that balance because we want as many people as possible to come and play the sport. Yeah. And you don't want to have to say to someone, you're not disabled enough. What mm. are the boundaries what is the boundary then? You're talking about painting these or creating these rules that didn't exist. What? That's a difficult thing. So for the international game, they've come up with a whole system that's hopefully going to work of A's, B's and C's disabilities. And there'll be a certain number of A's and B's and C's on the pitch. They're going to play 11 players, no able-bodied. There's always two people in red shorts who are non-contact. So you might have someone with a, a brain injury or a spinal injury. They tag and they get tagged. And what ends up happening is they become a really, really important member of your defensive team because you put one on either side of the ruck, one of their big forwards goes up, if you can get a red short to come out and just tag them, mm. saves us having to do the tackle. Yeah. And it frustrates them. So you then you see their big forwards going, man, I just want to plough through someone. And you've got this little guy with red shorts going, tag, sorry, you can't. Yeah. I've yeah. got a brain injury. Yeah. <laughs> but they become... <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> well, every, yeah. every, every, every time they do it, <laughs> you've got a brain injury. Yeah. Yeah. So they become really tactically important. We then had a classif We've all had a classification day. So I've been classified. They gave us a whole bunch of exercises to do, balance... Um, little sprints, movement, all that kind of stuff. I was classified as an A at the end of that, which is the least disabled. And there's a weird moment in that where they're about to tell you and you think, oh, I hope I'm a B. <laughs> <laughs> do you not do it on purposely really bad and go, oh, I'm struggling here, I'm definitely a C. We were warned by the classifiers who are proper Paralympic classifiers. They went, we can tell when you're faking. <laughs> we know. So... And so there's now a whole bunch of A's and B's and C's. Mm. And it's fascinating because like, so Sean Briscoe's the coach, the England coach. And I've chatted to him about it. There are people that he probably wouldn't have selected for the team. Yeah. But then he's, they've been classified as, because he thought they were an A. Mm -hmm. They've classified as a B and he's like, oh, hang on, now you're really useful to me because you're actually quite a good player for a B. Mm. And so someone like Josh, who's in our documentary, yeah. who has cerebral palsy and is quite restricted, he's a C. But he, he also does jujitsu, so he knows how to tackle. Like, he might not be all that fast, but if you run at him, he will find exactly the right spot to take yeah. you down. In fact, after we played at the ANZ, Andrew Johns found him after the game and went, where's Josh? And walked over to him and went, you get, I want to give you my jersey. That was the best tackle I've ever seen. Yeah. Like, he really? absolutely folded some guy in half. And, and there is something about it, because you, you wince when you're just watching it. You see someone like Josh, who, who has cerebral palsy, yeah. and he's getting smashed and smashed, and then he's up again, you know. But I mean, yeah, it's interesting, you wouldn't wince in, in every day. You know, we watch sport that is mm -hmm. gladiatorial. Yeah. You know, is there some sort of suggestion, I'm not saying from you, but when you're watching it, it doesn't feel right to watch somebody with a disability yeah, get Subconsciously hit you know the story behind yeah, it though, don't you? Yeah, no, but I'm saying yeah, yeah. the stories, yeah. everyone's got but a story. But at the same time, you didn't feel comfortable watching mm. Adam get smashed in your what, but I don't, late 40s that's and what get knocked unconscious and then you're crying in a hospital <laughs> saying, I've let my daughter down. But this down. is what <laughs> I don't understand. Is, are we, that, that's unnatural or feels uncomfortable all the time, doesn't it? 
You know, is it a wee bit, uh, what I'm trying to get into is, is the more sympathy towards people who have a disability in that situation? If there's, you know, somebody yeah, yeah. gets hit so hard and you, you, people wince. But actually, more, Jason, more Jason summed that up perfectly, yeah. I thought. In the, and Jason is basically the Mossy Masoy of the, the Warrington Media yeah, yeah. team, isn't he? I mean, he's battering around, but you wouldn't want to try and stop Jason. Um, and, and he sort of said quite poignantly in the, in the doc, he said, um, I want people to know me before they know my disability because I yeah. feel like I get written off and that will resonate with, with everyone with yeah, disabilities yeah. situations as we call them. I think to answer your question, yes, there is, there's probably, you do feel worse watching a disabled guy get belted. Yeah. But you feel better when you watch them get up. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's it. Like what I love and it's happened a few times is, is the first minute of a game, you'll, you'll see a massive contact going and you'll hear the crowd go, oh, and you're like, yeah, that's what I want. I want yeah, people yeah, yeah. to turn up and realise we're taking it seriously. And the best one was um, Magic Weekend. So we played like five minutes in half time in one of the games at Magic Weekend. So it wasn't like pre-game where you might have two or 300 people and maybe by the end of it, 1,000 people who have turned up to watch you know, the Super League yeah. game. It was, what, 10,000 people, 15,000 people at Anfield watching. And I got so many tweets afterwards from people going, I didn't realise you guys took it that seriously. Yeah. I think they think disability sports yeah. is going to be a little bit of, oh, let's just go easy on each other. Yeah. Yeah, it's not and, but none of us want that either. No. I don't want anyone going easy on me. That's, no. I, this is... Yeah. Well, there's a whole... I mean, look, we, we, could, we could do another four hours on disability yeah. sports. Can we? Yeah. Like, yeah. Just, I mean, someone just held up a sign saying 10 minutes left. We're going to have to do a bit longer than that because I want to talk to you about Channel 4 as well. Oh, yeah. But... Just on just on that, before we leave the PDRL stuff, you've obviously got the World Cup coming up. There's the, the wheelchair World Cup as well. Everything's been delayed, of course, because of COVID. Hopefully, it's all going to go ahead as planned. Yep. You've still got to choose a nationality and an allegiance as well. And you mentioned Sean Briscoe. Oh, 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 I mean, Sh big. Sean, obviously, the, the, the coach, um, his brother has cerebral palsy. I mean, his role is just so beautiful in, in all of this as well. In, in the dock, you see him walk with his brother across the hot coals. Yes. Um, but he he's convincing you to play for England. You, you have a hard decision on your hands because a lot of your teammates here at Warrington are, are going to be playing al alongside you if you choose England well the thing about Sean is he's played for his country and he he's he knows what it's like to be out there on the pitch and sing the national anthem and he said that's when you get goosebumps so he he knows what it would mean to me to sing my national anthem yeah but yeah the way he put it to me was well you know it's up to you have to choose whether or not you want to represent your country or win the world cup Wow. <laughs> Rock and a hard place. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck with that one. Yeah. So we're gonna make a second documentary about it and I'm not gonna make a decision until I'm on camera. But so it is are they patriotic or a winner? <laughs> That's yeah. what he, yeah. 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 Like and the thing is if it was any other coach, I wouldn't think twice about it. But because it's Sean and You're very close to him, aren't you? I'm really close with Sean. We've become really good mates throughout all of this. And also not just when you, you you know you guys know when you've gone through something with someone on the pitch mm. there's there's a little bond there and when we went out to australia sean said his highlight of the of the trip to australia was putting me over in the corner on redfern oval where i used to go and watch the rabbitos and i remember him even saying like he was like it was there because there's a specific way my name is set up north. Apparently yeah. the H isn't there. Sean anymore. would say a very specific way, wouldn't yeah. he? Honestly, EH at the end. It was there. When the first time we played with Sean, it took me so long to get my head around the Wigan accent. Yeah. We'd be out on the pitch in the, in the heat of the moment. He'd be like, Ilze, go for scoot, come round back. And I'd be like... <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> there's only good. so many times That's you can good. ask him to repeat himself <laughs> yeah. before yeah. you go... I was going to do what I think he said. <laughs> <laughs> but, so we were on Redfern Oval and he went, Ilze, in the corner. And right at that moment, they brought on little Leon, who's, who yeah, I, I think was nine, nine at that yeah. point and had cerebral palsy. And the, the call had gone, Leon's going up the middle. And Briscoe had kind of, Ilze, in the corner. And I was like, no, it's Leon. It's Leon's turn. <laughs> All right. So Leon went through and scored. And then when we got down the other end again, Brisk was looking at me like it was, he really, really wanted to put me over yeah. in the corner. And he made, he made sure it happened. Because when you're someone like Sean Briscoe, mm. I mean, that's... That's the joy of having an able-bodied player with you on yeah. the pitch, someone who's played to that level. Mm. You just watch him do stuff and go, man, you're not even... Again, I guess it's like watching a comedian who's at the top yeah. of their game. You're not even trying and no. yet you know exactly what to do. Yeah. So if it was any other coach, I'd probably go, right, it's Australia. But Sean, because he's a mate, but also the attitude he's taking towards this, which is he wants the disabled guys to get the same feeling that the able-bodied guys get. 
that the people representing England. He doesn't want like, okay, well, there's the England team. You guys just have your own kit. He's like, no, you have the same kit as them. You, you should be dressed exactly the same as them. You should have the same feeling. You should be yeah. treated the same. Yeah. And again, I guess it's because he's got a brother with a disability. He knows yeah. what it's like to... But they love that. And you can see that, you know, with the, with the initials on the on the kit and they're travelling on the bus. And a lot of the guys have just travelled to Wakeford on a bus before. Suddenly <laughs> they're flying to Australia yeah. and playing in front of Russell Crowe in Sydney. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And well, deservedly so. They got there on merit, you know. Well, and all of that was the stuff that Sean did. We all had our backpacks, as you say, with our initials on it. We all had suits. He, he made sure we had all that. Partly for the experience, but yeah. also we went out and trained at Redfern Oval and the Rabbitohs came and watched. We're all in training kit. We've all it's got... It's 1-0, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's 1-0, exactly. yeah. maybe 2-0. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I honestly think, Adam, you should be so proud of yourself for this because, you, because you, you've brought this community together and, um, you know, the, it, it gives these guys so much more of a quality in their life and, and something to look forward to every week. I know you travel up on a Tuesday to do it. Yeah. But, you know, you, there's this collection of friendships and they're, they're irreplicable, really, aren't they? They are. I, I've said. I've often said, if you, if you had said to everyone that's at training tonight, if you had said to them, "Hey, let's get together every Monday night and have a, you know, a disability awareness session," no one would have turned up. If you say, "Let's play rugby league," everyone turns up. But then at the end of it, you might have nights where you know someone, one, one of the guys with a prosthetic, will go, "So how do you?" I know, I've got, I'm having trouble with mine, and someone else will go, "Yeah, I'm getting blisters under mine." And then Josh, you know, with cerebral palsy, will ask a question, and then you'll actually end up chatting to each other about the disabilities, yeah, yeah. and then you form a WhatsApp group, and you're there for each other the whole time. Mm. Um, and I think, as you say, you know, being part of a team is is something really special. Yeah, being part of a team of people with disabilities that we all know what each other's going through mm. is also really special. But also, yeah. you know, the club is amazing. But like. Yeah. I was in an Aussie rules function recently and this, this is what opened my eyes up about sport more than anything else I reckon. There were two guys on stage, both of whom had won premierships, AFL premierships, mm. and they were asked what, what set those teams apart from any other team that you played in that didn't win a premiership. And both of them said the same thing, club culture. Mm. What goes on behind the scenes? And one of them explained it perfectly. He said, if you turn up on grand final day, the guy that comes off the bench with two minutes to go could be the guy that wins the game. So he has to be as pumped as everybody else is to be there. And yeah. he said, and in fact, if the guys that don't get picked in that team are still in the stands as excited as everybody else, then you're going to win the grand final. Yeah. And so for me, part of it is I love coming up and playing. Like I'm absolutely addicted to it. But another little part of the back of my brain is, well, if I figure if the guy from off the telly in, who lives in London can make it on a Monday night, then everybody else is going to make it on a Monday yeah. night. So it's... You, we all kind of bring yeah, each other along. Setting the example to follow, yeah. yeah. And, you, and you've Massive. been a flag bearer, you know, even from, from 2012 because, you know, covering obviously on Channel 4 and, and everything you do with the last leg in the podcast as well, the, the Winter Paralympics, the Winter mm. Olympic coverage um, and, you know, Paralympics as, as well, Tokyo and Beijing and, and something that I remember reading up on in the Beijing after party. Again, <laughs> perfect sort of comedy script writing material for you was, was you know, watching someone in a wheelchair um, snog someone with dwarf, dwarfism and then there's yeah. a blind guy chatting up a girl at the bar with cerebral palsy and you know that's that's so beautiful to see and that's because you, you explained it so well that you, you can't um, we as well we you know we can't resonate with Usain Bolt I'm talking to two athletes so I'm looking at you Adam mm. you know we can't the, the normal person on the street can't resonate with Usain Bolt because they haven't trained every day they're not conditioned themselves to do that yeah. but they can resonate with the the Paralympics because you yeah. know, someone who was working in a factory said the hand mangled in a, a piece of machinery you know, and then they want to compete at the highest level and they go on to do that. I think it's a different entry level. Like mm. you look at Usain Bolt and you go, I don't know, he's, he's there and I, I can't work out how I could get from here to there. But then you see someone with a disability at the Paralympics and go, I can, I can see that leap. Yeah, I yeah. can see where that would come from. Mm. So um, It's an approachable jump to like an elite level for people to watch as, as a viewer, isn't it? You know, to yeah. watch. And, and But the thing for me is, when, so I, I first covered the Paralympics in Beijing in 2008 for Australian TV. And the head of the Australian team um, took all the journalists aside, and this was the best thing I've ever been told. He basically said, look, <clears throat> these are elite athletes. They have trained their asses off for the last four years to get here. They are at the absolute peak of their game and fitness. If you cover them like that, then you will be doing the sport justice. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. If you cover them as disabled people who are having a go, yeah, then, yeah, then yeah, you it. will ruin yeah. everything. Because it's yeah. perfect for TV. It's perfect. Yeah. Time, isn't it? Mm. All the stories are Wheelchair there. as well. I can't wait. To, you know, when that's, because that's taking off, even that's kind of behind the eight ball, isn't it, of where, of where PDRL's been. 
oh man, wheelchair rugby league is amazing. Yeah. It is such an incredible sport. It's, it, because wheelchair rugby, I know we talked about this before, wheelchair rugby isn't, doesn't follow the rules of, of rugby union or rugby league. Wheelchair rugby was basically called that because the Paralympics wouldn't admit something called murder ball. <laughs> they went, oh, we've got this sport. What's it called? Murder ball. We are not putting murder ball in the game. <laughs> we'll call it rugby league. Can you call it something? <laughs> Let's call it rugby league instead. <laughs> the closest thing. Stick with fencing. They've got a sport called murder ball. Let's, <laughs> let's attach it to rugby league. <laughs> Those so stupid everybody in Red Hill. Yeah. That's exactly that's it. Idea. So they went, well, hey, that's where Nigel Wood went wrong. <laughs> no, it was his idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> so they went, let's call, it, let's call it wheelchair rugby and then maybe more people can get on board. But it's not, you can pass it forward. There's no tackles. There's no mm. set of six or anything like that. Whereas wheelchair rugby league is like rugby league. Mm. You, you have a set of six. You have to pass it backwards. You tag by yeah. grabbing you know, a tag. You can kick it. There's dropouts, tries, goals, all of that kind of stuff. And I've, I've played, I've trained with the Warrington team up here in wheelchair rugby league. It's great fun. Yeah. But as I was saying to you, you can't, they can swerve. Like they get to the point in a wheelchair where they can just go like move their body and the wheelchair moves. But yeah. when you start, you can't do that. So basically if you're, if you're in attack, you go, right, I'm just going to run that line. And, but you have to look for a gap. There's no point going, well, I'm going to run at him instead. Put a bit of footwork on. Yeah. <laughs> So you go, you try that the first time and go, oh, that's, that's it's not done. working. <laughs> so you go, right, there's a gap. So you, you become better at looking for the gaps. You go, right, there's a gap. I'm just going to fang my wheelchair at that and hope someone passes it to me. So you, <laughs> Safe to say you're not going to make the uh, wheelchair team. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if he is, he's just giving away a big secret. Yeah. He's just oh. going to run one yeah. line. He's, 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 he's wheeling on one line here. He's committed. He's not, yeah. The Forrest Gump of the, the <laughs> wheelchair <laughs> well. He's sitting yeah. ahead. <laughs> Look, we've got, um, I know you've got a train later. Have you got another 10 minutes and then we'll wrap yeah, yeah, up? Yeah, 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 Because I, obviously, basically what you, what you didn't know is that when Adam came in a Winnebago this afternoon, um, his agent insisted that we have to mention Rockstar Detectives, his novel that's out. He's writing a second novel as well. And also the Channel 4 coverage. And if we didn't, this wouldn't be Absolutely. So we, it's our, our, our privilege to do yeah. so well, isn't it? <laughs> Even if you're trying to put him on the spot and make him feel <laughs> little, which is what you're very good at. Ch Channel 4 was, was perfect for you, wasn't it? Because obviously you're part of the Channel 4 family yeah. and everything we've just talked about over the last half an hour or so in terms of bringing people together, trying to bring a sport to terrestrial TV. I think you, there was a little clip which went up on Twitter, which was just perfect, isn't it? In the space of 45 seconds, you, you summed it all up. You know, the sport up north that, that's yeah, always yeah. been the underdog and you've always been the underdog. So you've got an underdog hosting the underdog coverage. As I mentioned at the top, we've got the rivals. We've got Sky on this side. We've got Channel 4 over there. But, but when, you, when you saw Channel 4 get the rights... To those games, you must have thought, "Bang, get me in straight away." I'll, I'm going to be completely honest. No, no, like comedy humility or anything else involved. My first thought was, "I'm not the right person for this," because you asked at the very beginning what I'm rubbish at. Yeah, genuinely, I don't, I don't think I'm great at presenting rugby league, and this isn't false modesty. But let me explain. Um, when they when when it, they first got it, people were saying, "Well, you're, you're the perfect guy," and I was like, "No, I'm not." You want, you want someone who knows rugby league. You want an expert out there. You don't want some comedian who, yeah, I play and I love it. But you want, I mean, I, I, I really enjoy this guy coverage. And I think Brian uh, Carney, fantastic. Like he's so good. And a really good example of that is that, I'm going to skip ahead and then skip back. They said to me, do you want an auto cue? And I went, well, yeah, that's why I have on the last leg. It'd be really good to have, you know, the words up in front of me. And I mentioned it to someone recently who went, they never have auto cue in live sport. Like, yeah. so you watch Brian Carney and you know all of that's coming off the top of his head. He's not reading a script. He's, yeah. he, all that knowledge is in there. So my first response was, I'm not the right guy for this. You want, to, you want someone who knows rugby league <clears throat> and can express it properly. And then Channel 4 said, well, look, here's the thing. It's, it's going to be opened up to a whole new bunch of people who've never seen rugby league before. So we need someone who knows it enough but can also explain it to someone who's never watched league before. And a, sh a TV show that I used to host in Australia was a music quiz show called Spicks and Specs, named after a Bee Gees song. And my job then was, I wasn't a music nerd, I love music, but I don't have the music knowledge, but I had the experts around me, and so they would answer questions, and then I would look at the camera and explain what had just gone on. And I thought, okay, well, if that's what they want me to do with rugby league, I can do that. Yeah. I'm not... And you'll notice if you watch it, I don't give any opinions, because I don't think I'm qualified. I'll ask the people around me and go what's going on here so basically my way of approaching it is i'm a fan i'm a real fan of the game i don't have the level of knowledge than the people around me and i'm going to ask them to explain it my favorite moment of the games that we've covered is the halftime analysis 
because I go out in the truck and I sit with Danica Prim or Leon Price and then we've had Sam Tompkins and who was amazing by the way Sam yeah, Sam's good isn't it Sam did a brilliant thing in like we rehearsed a bit and he realized that what he was saying wouldn't translate to people that didn't know the game so he he used different words to put it across because mm. he knew the audience we were going to so then I get to sit there watch a game look at Leon and listen to Leon and Danica and Sam and whoever else telling me what's going on and then we get out there at half time and I'm like so what just happened? Uh -huh. And they'll be like, well, this happened and then this happened and then this. And I'm like, right. And so what can they do to f turn that around in the second half? And they're like, well, they've got to do this and this and this. And you're like, holy shit. I'm walking <laughs> away from this guy. I'm learning so much yeah, as a yeah. fan. But where I'm coming unstuck genuinely is the post-match stuff because post-match, as you know, you can't prepare for it. You don't know what's going to happen. What's yeah. going to happen. You just got to come off the top of your head. And that's where... They'll look to me to fill, and I'm like, I am not your guy. Right nah. now. <laughs> I am not your Is guy. That, that's your uh, your moment. Then we're all going to be watching now for post match. Yeah. We're, we're, everybody who's listening to this is honing in on post match to watch. Absolutely. I mean, the last game they went. All right. Um, uh, make sure you mention the Sky game because we we know that there's a Sky yeah. game later that night. And so they went mention the Sky game, and I'm like, okay, if you want to see more uh, rugby league, tune into Sky tonight. Catalans. Are at home. That's another Shit. team. I can't remember who they're playing, <laughs> they're playing or what time I it think is. You can get away with that. Yeah. I think that's. I I don't know. You, I, I I think you get away with that really well. I think when you present yourself as really polished, and actually, yeah. Will I know Will will hear this as a compliment. Will is an incre You're an incredibly polished presenter. When I've watched you professionally, and think, wow, that's really clean. Wow, he's great. Yeah, no, all, all of his stuff's really clean. Whereas I think you present as that. It, you know, it's like that, isn't it? It's more casual, and that's what Channel Four. The essence of Channel Four, right, is a bit on the edge, casual. You know, risk taking anyway, mm. isn't it? Well, and I think that's why they put us on the pitch because they wanted us to be in the middle of it all and and looking like. We're all part of the action. Mm. And it is, it, it's great. I mean, the last game at Hull, when it was snowing, we kind of walked out to do the halftime thing. And um, I think it was Tommy Makinson looked at uh, Paul Sculthorpe and just went, mate, I can't feel my hands. <laughs> yeah. I genuinely can't feel my hands. So, yeah. if, you know, if, if we were up in the studio, we wouldn't have had that. Yeah. But um, And viewers love that interaction as well, won't they? I think so. Yeah. I'm, I reckon, though, here's my theory, though. I think there's only so many times I can be a bit shit. No, I don't. <laughs> Before yeah. they start but going. No. You've this done two. Just... You've done Leeds Warrington, and then you did Hull, Hull against St. Helens in the snow. So yes. you had testing conditions already. Yeah. And, that. and I think, just as you said it, you know, you, you're Super League, quite, quite rightly, are desperate to, to attract a new audience, to attract a new audience. You know, the people of Wakefield in their 40s to 60s are going to be dead soon. They, they need a new audience to keep it thriving. And obviously Sky has its cult following, but then, you know, when it's not on Sky, they, they will come to, to Channel 4. Um, what have you made of it, interestingly? Because obviously yeah. you're, on the, you're on the other side of things. Well, it's, it's funny, we were chatting on the way down here. So I, I think when I spoke about some of the challenges, me and Mark were chatting, I was thinking one of the challenges might be that auto cue, you know, having the something there to say. I was like, that's quite tough. I, you know, I'd find that pretty tough in that situation the coverage has been great I think the production of it has been great and I think what's really important is that it does feel different to the other productions that are out there to rugby league the BBC just do what Sky are doing no but the BBC nonsense, look right? I've worked for the BBC for 15 years mm. so they do a very specific style and, yeah. and I think Sky is a, a different style mm. Channel 4's come in as a different style uh, but what's important is the amount of people who get to watch the game right mm. and, yeah. and to some extent I remember always remember um I think it was Claire Baldwin said to me when I first started doing little bits for the BBC, he said, you are not going to affect the viewing figures. Yeah. Don't worry. Do you Go know? And I was like, drunk. right. You know, yeah. the people are going to turn on and watch. Yeah. And look, in time it'll grow. But yeah. it's, you know, it, whether we're good or bad, Adam, you know, I think the, the game and the product being on terrestrial telly is the that's, big, that's, that's the big that's story the here, yeah. isn't it? That's yeah. the key, yeah. isn't it? Terrestrial TV, because, I mean, look, and even the numbers, I've got them in front of me from, from week one are impressive. 750,000 nearly from, from the first week and, you know, week two, 624,000 peak numbers. That, that's huge numbers for rugby league, isn't it? For rugby yeah. league. Yeah. Like, it's it's so that, much higher than any other viewing figures for Channel 4 during that time as well. So it's mm. it's a win-win for the game and it's a different avenue for, for Channel 4, isn't it? But, but to have them, Adam, on the telly, I'm, 
and I'm just thinking back to the great Shane Warner we lost this week. You know, mm. the, the reason that he was such a star, obviously, was at the top of his game, and you would have watched him cause all sorts of problems when you yeah, know, yeah. With the ball of the century to Gatting and so on. But the fact that he was on terrestrial, so people of my age and slightly older, you know, 93, 94, I remember that being just on in the background, like mm. on Channel 4, as in, you know, so was Football Italia and Italian football. Yeah. You remember those sports when you were a kid, because let's face it, that's the audience we're trying to attract going forward. Yeah. They will see that on in their living rooms, Channel 4, watching, watching these massive massive hits leads against St. Helens, the, you know, the Good Friday derby, all the, the fact that that can, I know Sky will obviously not necessarily agree with this to a certain degree, but that is the future. And, and, and then hopefully Sky will obviously want to take that audience back to them and so on. But it, the fact that we've got a battle of broadcasters is what it's all about. Well, I, but I don't see it as a battle. I no, see it I as don't. like we're doing No, a good battle. Like, I mean, no. it's only good for the game, the battle. I'm yeah, sure. but even before the first game, like I got, I got messages from Jenna yeah. and from Barry McDermott saying best of luck. And then from Tanya Arnold as well. Like we're all, I think we're all on the same team and we're mm -hmm. all doing the same thing. Yeah. And I think what's great about the figures and what Channel 4 are very happy about, this is not the stuff that I completely understand, but the 16 to 34 year olds, the mm -hmm. percentage of 16 to 34 year olds mm -hmm. that have watched the last two games is massive. And Channel 4 like that, that's who they aim at any, anyway. And that's but, so important because kids don't watch TV and they don't watch sport. They watch everything on a phone. They watch the highlights. They, don't, they, don't, they won't sit through 80 minutes. They won't. So if, they're, if they've, well, they're saying those numbers are high, that's, that's huge. Yeah. yeah. And the nature of how we consume media is changing all the time. It's changing under our feet. And every second it's changing streaming. You know, the, the future of, of broadcasting is changing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, without doubt. Like, you know, do we think channels in the constant format that they are now terrestrial sort of set up and all of that will exist in the future i'm not yeah you know, i don't know i think that's all sort of evolving i think look the game having a presence on terrestrial through the bbc and through channel four i think is 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 is, is huge yeah. um and and i think developing as many sort of places for people of different walks of life to have traction with the game is undoubtedly just good strategy to promote the game and create more interest in the game yeah but that being said, and I'm not just saying this because I work for Sky, Sky pretty much bankrolled Rugby League for the last 15 oh, years as, as well. So it's easy, look, to go, oh, you know, Channel 4 and, and is the answer and let's all celebrate that. Well, look, I'm <laughs> like I said, I've only just started working there. I've been there like a month. But they have put an awful lot of money into the game, which also needs to be respected. And I'm not suggesting that it's not. I'm and just, we're doing a podcast from Sky Sports, we should say, coming yeah, up. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely coming it's, up. It's, um, it's just an exciting time for the coverage. And what an exciting well, job. What I just oh, wanted to intervene yeah. with that is, is also that, and you, Mark, you, you all know this, I remember watching with your dad on, on telly and watching games. And obviously, this isn't, yeah, I'm mentioning yeah, yeah. being on Terrestrial. BBC have had the Challenge Cup for quite a few years. Yeah. But being able to you know, sit in the front room, you imagine you in, in Oz with your dad and watch the telly on the game because that's that it's that generation generational bond and family bond which sucks yeah. you in for life, doesn't it? Yeah. And so and what what I'm what I'm most excited happy about and also humbled by is that those figures, I think it was seven hundred and fifty thousand for that first game. That was the peak, and that was with ten minutes to go, and that leads Warrington was a great game. game. Yeah, yeah, with ten yeah. minutes to go was the most exciting part. Yeah. Um and that's what you want. You're exactly yeah. right. The game sells itself. Um, <laughs> the, the the figures for pre-show and post-show, like it's, it's the game is you know people the figures go like this for us, and then the game starts, and of course it goes through the roof. Yeah. That's what you want. You want people watching the game. Yeah. Alex Brooker, who's on the last leg, was great. Now he's a massive football fan, massive Arsenal fan. And after the whole game, he was talking to me. and He went, "Do you know what else?" He said, "I sat down on Saturday morning." And I turned it on to the Channel 4 coverage to watch you fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> and the game started and I thought, I'll put it over to the football. And I watched the football for 10 minutes and I thought, this is boring. And I put it back to the rugby. He said, I watched the whole game. I did it. He said, I did not turn off for the whole game. Yeah, and he said, that's why I was messaging you. I couldn't believe some of the shit that was happening. Yeah, and yeah. That's, that's really all I, I want. Yeah. Yeah. it to happen is more people just see how the, how great the game yeah. is and as you say you know we're all in this together we're all, I remember sure. being at a Four Nations game years ago and Tanya Arnold interviewed me at half time for BBC and she said um, do you reckon you could do for rugby league what you did for disability sport and I was like how sad is it that the the the, the attention goes disability sport and then rugby league yeah. <laughs> that's not yeah. what it's like where I come from you know yeah. growing up in Sydney rugby league's the biggest sport so um, and yeah I'm fully aware that like how indebted the game is to sky like at no point have i seen it as a battle you know I, I sit down in fact after doing the first game 
like I said, I've always enjoyed the Sky coverage, but after doing the first game, I then sat down and watched it again and just had renewed appreciation for it. Going, I don't think there's an auto cue there. Brian is has got all the facts and all the knowledge, and it just comes but out. You're not there. there to be Brian, and that's the point. So you just need to keep doing what you're doing. Oh no, totally. Working, yeah. I'll be. I'm happy to be me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely. But um, you know, I think between us and the BBC and Sky, like we yeah. just. It's, it's a three-pronged attack to yeah, get rugby No, I meant that battle they? in a good sense from everything, you know. It, oh, no, yeah, the, the, yeah, and obviously yeah, yeah. It's, it'll be fascinating because I've had many conversations with Robert Elston about this over the years and the whole broadcast picture going forward is, is well, intriguing. Was, he was brought up, brought in to do, get this situation exactly. going. Exactly. Yeah. He's yeah. gone. Yeah. <laughs> the oh, yeah. It's like you mentioned that little thing that we put on, that little video clip that we put out about, you know, I love rugby league. So the first meeting I had with the producers, I'd kind of said to them, look, I'm... I'm you know, I don't know the history necessarily here. I don't know the statistics, but I can talk about what I love about rugby league and that it's more than a sport because that's the one thing I've noticed here. It is more than a sport. It's a, it's a you know... It's a community. Yeah, it's a community, exactly. Yeah. And um, then the next meeting they had, they went, do you want to write a little thing with, about it being more than a sport? And I went, yeah, okay. And I kind of went away and, and wrote that and then sent it to the producer. And now... The guy who makes that clip made a lot of clips for the Paralympics and the Olympics in 2012. Yeah. He's from Hull. Joe Gardner. Joe Gardner. Name, yeah. name check him. He's yeah. a good lad. He's handsome a great handsome lad. Joe. Handsome <laughs> Joe. Shout out. Naturally grey hair. Yeah. He dyes it. <laughs> I'm sure he dyes it. He does. Yeah. But he loves, he loves rugby league. He grew up in Hull. And then the first meeting I had at Headingley, all of the people behind the scenes, who I, I think a lot of them do the sky coverage as well, mm. They all love the sport. They're not just people going, yeah, go on, we'll cover this. They're like, this is my... F they, it was all like, okay, who do you follow in the NRL? This is who I follow. Who's your favourite player? Mm -hmm. There's, it's, like, it's like a whole bunch of people who've been part of this little club that haven't been allowed to talk about the club. <laughs> yeah. It's and like now, Fight Club. It's like, yeah, it is yeah. like yeah. Fight Club. Don't talk about rugby league. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like Fight Club, but someone's changed the first rule That's and it. you now can talk about yeah. Fight Club. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, mate, I don't want to keep you any longer because you've you spent a long time with us. We really appreciate you, Adam. You've been a brilliant guest and you've got to go and train. So you've got to get your kits on because you're training tonight. Training um, tonight. Look, massive year for rugby league, isn't it? Obviously, the World Cup coming, thankfully, and it's all been postponed, but the Wheelchair Rugby League World Cup, the PDR. It's a massive year for uh, Rugby World League, Cup. isn't it? It's huge. Yeah. Do you know when you just think of COVID, we've had all this stuff and everything's delayed. And more eyes and than ever with all these, you know, with Channel 4 doing what they're doing. Yeah, so. What a year for Rugby League. It's going to be brilliant. Yeah. It's almost like it's all... And there was a moment, I remember when it was when the when the World Cup was was called off last year, I kind of felt like, yeah, but this could be, this could be good for next year. I didn't know the Channel 4 stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's really coming together. Yeah, it is such a massive year for the sport. It's so yeah. exciting to be involved in it. We'll have to get you back on, mate, for sure. Oh, any time. Yeah. And, this, and look, we, like I said earlier, we could have done a yep. an hour and a half podcast just purely on the kind of stigma and taboo of, uh, of yeah. Paralympic sport and kind of where I, that goes in terms I'm of I'm going to be honest. I'm going to say this right now. I've done you know loads of podcasts and I ended up stopping doing podcasts because I thought... I keep saying the same things over and over. There's no new things I can say. I've said stuff to you. I've said shit to you guys that I've not said. <laughs> oh, you said that to everybody. It's like Fight Club. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <it's like, laughs> mate, thank you so much. Oh, it's um, been such a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I hope thank you've enjoyed you, mate, that, everyone. Yeah. And um, give us a little follow on at Out of Your RL because I was looking also on, uh, I just had a little glance on the train at just reviews. Reviews are so important, aren't they? Oh, Even though, we're, you know, I'm like you, John, I'm a bit, it's a bit yeah. unclassy yeah. to ask for people to like your podcast. Most of it just says John Wilkins a wanker when you go on, um, on <laughs> iTunes true. and look down and on Spotify and so on. So if you true. do like it, just click on the stars because that's true. what keeps us going. Adam, you're a top man, mate. Oh, it's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed that. Uh, yeah. And we will see you all in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much.